My name is Adil Najm, and I am the Dean of the Pardi School of Global Studies here at Boston University. And it is, it is my uh, great, great pleasure to have uh, three of our very distinguished experts on infectious disease who are all totally engrossed right now in the coronavirus uh, question with me, all three from our medical campus. And we will be discussing for the next hour uh, the question of coronavirus, but also and especially in the context of the future of infectious disease. And uh, the party center, uh, which is hosting this, is dedicated to the idea of understanding the grand problems, the grand challenges of our times, not just for today, but with a eye to the long-term impact of that. So let me very briefly introduce my guests, and then uh, then we will we will start directly with them. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Nahid Bhadelia. Dr. Bhadelia is at the School of Medicine uh, of Boston University. We also have uh, David um, Hammer with us. He is at the School of Public Health and also at the School of Medicine. And we have Jerry Kirsch, who is also at both the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine. And more importantly, maybe right now, all three of them are very uh, deeply involved with NEDO, which is the uh, National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratory, uh, one of the, the leading places, not just here in the Northeast, but in the country. Uh, actively working on this issue and trying to find solutions for it. So it is it is a pleasure to have all of you. My gratitude, deep gratitude for finding the time amongst all the things that you are doing. And um, on YouTube right now, we have, I am told, um, people from um, all over the world, actually, who are listening in. And what we want to do is to have a conversation. I'll start with very brief uh, uh, brief remarks, and, and, and then we will have a conversation. I'm told we have about 125 people listening in right now from across the world, and, and that, that, is, that is growing. Uh, I, will, I would like to start with you, David, maybe to set us up very briefly. Uh, everyone has been hearing a lot about coronavirus, and part of me wonders if we are hearing so much that it's become difficult to make sense of all of that. So, so maybe you can help us, the, the, the non-medical practitioners, what is the most important thing that I or those who are watching us should know about the virus, its mechanisms of infection, and, and, and the process? Okay, that's a fairly broad question, but I'll try and tackle it um, and be brief at the same time. So, so this is a, a, a novel virus. It's a member of a family of viruses that, that we actually have four different members of that can cause seasonal um, respiratory tract infections um, that cause relatively mild disease. There have been two other members of that family that arose and caused fairly severe epidemics. One of them was the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, the original SARS virus. And, 2002, it came out of southern China and then spread to Hong Kong, Toronto, and other parts of the world. That eventually came under control and then completely disappeared in 2003. Um, there's a Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus that arose around 2012 and has been causing intermittent outbreaks in the Middle East. Um, this one arose uh, really in, in China, in, in Wuhan, it appears, um, in December. Um, it may have emanated originally from uh, either a bat coronavirus or potentially through an intermediate animal. The pangolin is one that's been raised because of the similarity of the genetics uh, structure of, of sequence virus to, to that organism. But it's clearly, it looks very close to, to a bat coronavirus also. We may never know exactly where it came from, but, but it, it, it jumped to humans and started going human to human. And, and, and this, this virus appears to be, I'd say, more easily spread than the previous two SARS coronavirus in terms of the, the facility is spread from person to person. And, and I'd say one really key message is that we've been learning, this was all over the news today. Um, I've already been talking about this for a week, but uh, CNN picked it up today. And that is that there, for a few days, in some people, once you're exposed to the virus, you incubate for a few days, then you start to shed virus, and then a few days later, you may develop symptoms. And 
we've we've gotten inklings of this over the last couple of months, but I think it's better documented now. And this means that people that have no symptoms can be shedding the virus and can potentially transmit it to other people. And from a public health standpoint, trying to control viral spread in a context like that is very difficult. A couple other things we've learned is that this virus can cause very severe disease. It can also cause a very mild illness. And some people have, you know, sort of a runny nose, sore throat, maybe a low-grade fever and a dry cough and then recover. But others, especially people of older age, in particular over the age of 60, but 70s, 80s, much higher risk. Um, and then underlying um, medical diseases, so there's a, a range that have been described mainly initially based on the data from China. So um, heart disease, lung disease, hypertension, diabetes. Um, what we're learning from Italy, and then we're starting to learn here in Boston is that uh, diabetes is definitely a big factor. Um, advanced age is a factor, but also obesity. So being overweight appears to be a risk factor for disease, both severe disease and potentially death. Um, so that, that's another, I think, important message. I mean, it, I think, you know, why, why don't I stop there? I mean, those are a couple key things. I think that if we compare this to seasonal influenza or to the pandemic H1N1 strain of influenza that, that circulated around the world in, in 2009, this appears to be a little more easily spread and a little you know, more transmissible from person to person. And it, it thus far, you know, various estimates of the case fatality rate, it probably is gonna end up being more severe than those. Um, even, even the lowest um, estimate of case fatality rate uh, for, for this virus are, are quite a bit higher than, than uh, pandemic influenza. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, want, to, I want to move to, to uh, Nahid, but before that, if I can ask you one more thing, which would be obvious to you, but, but it's an important word for the rest of us, which is pandemic. Right? That, that word, the sound of that word itself has great heft. What does it mean to you? And, and I assume the heft we assume for the word is in fact real. So, I mean, what it means to me is, is that there's a, a basically very widespread distribution of a disease that's affecting almost you know, every, every part of the world. And at this point, I think nearly every single country or territory worldwide, there may be a few it hasn't reached, um, but almost every, every one has, has had cases um, often introduced initially through travel, but then with local spread and, and difficulty containing. And, and, and the, it's, it's basically when, when something's a pandemic, it's basically, you know, very widespread. In this case, it's, it's almost worldwide. I mean, even like Burundi and Sierra Leone were in the news just in the last 24 hours of having identified their first cases. Um, and usually it means also that there's a very large scale to the epidemic, that there, there are large numbers of cases and, and often case, you know, uh, deaths associated with the outbreak. Adil, can I jump in on that? Uh, please, uh, with please a do. Brief uh, um, comment. Um, there's a political dimension to the use of the term. And I think that's, that's very important. Uh, WHO is very reticent to talk about things like pandemics. They were very slow to declare this um, in this instance of, of the coronavirus. Um, but um, what happens when you talk about a pandemic is that there's a mobilization of global resources in terms of response. And I think the criteria for when we start to mobilize on a global scale need to be rethought. We should not be so reticent to call it what it is um, and then act on it. Yeah. That's a good point, and I want to come back to that, and, and I'll, I'll flag it now, uh, because in some ways, while the response is global, meaning everywhere there is a response, there is also a surprising lack of a global response, which is means everyone getting together to do something. But I, I'll hold that thought, because I wanted to come to Nahid for a minute. The last time, <laughs> Nahid, we talked here at the party school family, was when, when Ebola was being was, was up in the news and we talked to you. And, 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 and that was very scary, but in a different way. And I wanted to sort of ask you, both in that context, but especially in the coronavirus uh, context, how do, how do you think of these things differently and how should we think of these things differently? 
Thanks, Azil. And, and actually, we spoke in between about Zika, uh, yes. which tells you actually the, the speed and frequency with which we see emerging infectious diseases arise on the international stage. And, and every time we have a new disease, particularly one that we are learning scientifically about while we're responding to it, there are these unique challenges, right? For every disease, the, whether you get critically ill or die from it, uh, it the, the three factors are who are you as an individual? So some of the risk factors that David talked about, what is the disease? What is this capacity to wreak havoc on your body? You know, how does it spread in different areas? And the third is the healthcare capacity, healthcare facility capacity, healthcare system and public health system. And so, you know, whether it's Ebola or Zika or, or it is COVID-19, diseases play out differently in different milieus of, of all of those things combined, different population risk factors and health systems and public health risk factors. And you're kind of seeing that here again, you know, and the added challenge of emerging infectious diseases is that you are trying to, there's general principles that apply to all of these diseases in terms of response, but then you're trying to learn the science, apply it to logical policies at the medical level, at the level of protecting healthcare workers, at the level of treating patients, at the level of making sensible public health policies that others should follow. And so, you know, people are, we saw this in Ebola and, and we're sort of seeing that this now in COVID-19 as well, that there is, you know, a lot of um, anxiety because people are seeing public health um, actors change their, their recommendation as the outbreak goes on. And some of that is a reflection of that greater knowledge of science as it's growing. Um, the biggest challenges at the at the it's a, the Ebola and Z, you know and, and COVID nineteen are different in, in the fact that Ebola individually carries a huge risk for mortality for people who get sick. So you might if you get sick with this disease, there's a much greater chance of, of you dying from it versus COVID nineteen. Even though the the number of people who are going getting sick with COVID nineteen is much larger. Um, the, and part of the reason why is because, as David spoke, it's about the way that it's transmitted. Um, it is transmitted through a respiratory um, uh, aspect, which uh, that does not play a big role in Ebola. That re really requires close contact with a patient um, who's sick with this disease. And that's part of, partly what goes into why it makes it so difficult to control, because you aren't talking about patients in even hundreds or even thousands as we've seen in the DRC outbreak recently in Ebola or the West Africa epidemic, um, we're talking people in hundreds of thousands around the world, each in their own milieu of public health systems and healthcare systems. So within the hospitals, it's also very different. Um, after the Ebola epidemic, um, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in the United States passed a certain amount of um, funding for regional centers of excellence that could take care of patients like Ebola, um, and then would prepare other facilities to send patients with that, that match that definition about somebody who has a viral hemorrhagic fever like Ebola to one of these specialized centers. So we were all prepared, and, and, and at the back of everybody's mind, there was always a consideration is that that model doesn't take into account a disease where hundreds appear at the same time to your emergency room. You know, that we had handled that a little bit with H1N1. Um, you know, thankfully, we were not affected in the United States as much with SARS, uh, but a lot of Asian countries were, and, and they had to sort of think through uh, with some of those aspects that we did during H1N1 as well. What you've seen currently is, is um, some of the things that have played out here in the United States, at least, and in other places, is, are the role of, of testing and quickly identifying these patients in the community. Um, and early on, that helped sort of limit the spread um, in, out in the community. And, and now it still helps with that, but you know, it also helps us identify those patients that come into the hospital um, and separating those patients from others who don't have that disease. Um, helping us figure out, you know, for those who do have that disease, if we can confirm that they have the disease through testing, we can figure out, are they a candidate for an experimental drug that might have its own risks and benefits? Um, and the other big thing that's playing out is just the safety of healthcare workers. Everybody's seen, you know, the news stories, the experiences we ourselves here are having in Boston. Um, and so the balance has been threefold, tackling a large volume of patients coming into our healthcare system, providing the best care possible to those patients and others, and keeping healthcare workers safe. So there's a lot more I can go into, but I will stop there for the sake of brevity. No, that, that is very good. And I wanted to pick on what you said and what he said about the scale and go back to Jerry 
to, to help make it more global for us again, that um, it is clear that there is the virus, um, virus issue, the pandemic, but it is also clear that there's an emergency everywhere, even in the supposedly best prepared countries, which is a health systems emergency. So as a Pakistani, I know that we have a health system in Pakistan that's not very good, but in the US, in Italy, in places where we thought we had the type of healthcare systems that we wanted, uh, we are finding those under stress. And so I wanted Jerry to bring back the politics and policy at a global level, that there also is this amazing unequalness in preparedness to deal with something like this. Um, you've hit on something that we could spend the rest of the 45 minutes talking about. Um, so we're not gonna resolve that in, in just a few minutes, but the, but the key issues are that, and I, I would put it in, in the context of when public health works, you prevent things from happening. So what the public sees, and importantly, what the politicians see is nothing. And they say, why am I gonna put money and resources into nothing? And then they withdraw the resources. We did that in this country, in this administration, across the government. Um, the um, attempts to reduce the funding to the CDC in the, in the president's budgets every year, to reduce the budget to the NIH every year. Congress didn't accept that. But our, our state and local public health um, department are starved for resources. And then because of that lack of preparedness and investment, when something happens and something hits that fan that's proverbially turning, then they say, it's your fault, we're not prepared. That is the consummate concern that all of us have. And you just go back from the middle of March until now and look at the statements emanating from the administration, not from my dear friend, Tony Fauci, um, but from others. And you see this denial, this attempt to put, put a political calm over a roiling sea. And um, you say, this is all wrong. That's in a country that claims to have the best healthcare system, the best this, the best that. And we have performed horribly. Um, so I don't have to look around the world um, to, to see where performance has not met the rhetoric, where change is absolutely necessary. And you can read whatever you want into my use of the term change. Um, <clears throat> we can, we know how, and we should, and we must do better. Now there are plenty of countries, your country of origin as well, that is <clears throat> as, as is poorly equipped, doesn't have the resources, um, and they are going to suffer. This virus has some characteristics that make it particularly dangerous. And David and Nahid um, talked about that. So this is going to continue on and create increasing problems until we do get it under control with basically old fashioned public health mitigation strategies until we have some therapeutics that might work and then down the road, a vaccine. Let me bring David back. And, and David, this is both relation to what you had said earlier about the scale that, that becomes a pandemic. But I also recall when we first started talking about this panel, which was nearly a month ago, and no one was talking about Africa, for example, at that point. And you, in, when we approached you, you said, you know, by the time you do this, this would have, this, we would be talking about it in other parts of the world. And here we are, are today. So what is that scale and scope, both sort of the breadth in how many places and the scale in terms of numbers? mean for trying to deal with it as a public health, global public health question, uh, when sort of there's a, sort of this wave that it, even if it's peaking in one place, it is starting it at another. And we have to deal with this in a, in a planet that you can't really, 
put in quarantine as a whole and, and, and preparedness is different. So what does scale mean for you? I, I think you're getting at some issues that I'm really concerned about for the, the sort of medium term, if not long term. And that is, um, you know, like it, this, this virus is taking off in sub-Saharan Africa. It's starting to really move in, in South America. Uh, my colleagues in Bangladesh, it's really scary there. And they have not done social distancing like India has tried to do, but trying to do that in such a densely populated country um, as India or, or as, as Bangladesh, and, um, it's just, you know, not really feasible. And, you know, they're so under-resourced to begin with that, that you know, it's going to be a public health disaster um, in these places. But, but more, more importantly is that in, it's, if there's sort of a moving epidemic at different times of the year in different places, then we get things under control with our, our you know, old-fashioned methods, as Jerry's described it, of, of social distancing and shelter at home and various other approaches, which you know, appear to maybe start to be working now, which is great, but you know, we, we can't let our guard down. Or when we do, we've got to be very cautious here, but then there's going to be a risk for importation. And then what are we going to do? Are we, we can't ban travel. I mean, it, it's, it's so they're going to have to, and you can't really screen for this effectively because fever is not always present and people may be shedding virus well before they develop a fever. So airport-based screening is not going to be an effective measure. Um, so, so I think that, and the other comment I have is that if this proves to be a disease with a seasonal change, if it drops off during the summer, like many respiratory viruses do, and then comes back in the fall and winter, the fall and winter um, in South America and Southern Africa are going to be this June, July. And so they're going to be having, they could be having their peak um, and then it can sort of come back here. So there's sort of the cycles that, that could happen through, through international travel, in, especially in countries that are under-resourced in terms of being able to test, um, do adequate surveillance, and then, and then control the disease. Very worrisome scenario. Can I actually jump in on this as well, Adil? So uh, beginning of February, I was traveling from Uganda to Liberia back to the United States as this was sort of becoming this large outbreak. And I wrote this, um, I wrote this editorial for The Atlantic about this idea of scale, you know, in resource limited settings. And one thing that I wanted to add to all the excellent points that David had made is that the problem is in many areas, we may never know the scale. Um, at the terminal end of, of all infectious diseases surveillance are potentially communities that have no access to care, no ability to di do diagnostic testing, a widespread diagnostic testing at the public health level. And that's increasing, but, you know, and it's interesting because now just this morning or yes, yesterday morning, this morning, Wednesday, I had a conversation with my colleagues in Uganda about this very conversation about, you know, they're seeing an increase in the number of patients, you know, but how would you know the way this disease is? It looks very common to a lot of other diseases unless you're doing diagnostic testing or you are doing radiological testing, um, unless you're really actively screening, finding cases you may not know that skill in resource limited settings. And, and that is the most unjust, I think, and the most scariest thing for me, uh, for a lot of our partners who are, are in Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America or other resource limited settings therein. So I, I want to come back to the politics, but I want to stick with this for a minute. And maybe this is for David or Nahid, or any, any of you, but, but uh, Nahid, I'll start with you. You know, I'm a numbers guy. Uh, I understand numbers, I can make graphs, I can play with them. And, but, but part of me wonders what numbers should I be looking at? Sometimes I look at my television screen in this country and other countries, and it seems like it's sport reporting, as if there's a match going on and there's a game, and I don't know which numbers mean what, especially when I know that testing may not be enough or reporting may not be enough. So as people in the midst of this, what do you take note of when you're trying to figure out what's happening? So there are a couple of things. I mean, one important number is the number of people we are admitting because, and many people are seeing that require healthcare capacity, you know, and access because that has a direct impact on our ability and resilience to respond to this with those patients, but also our ability and resilience to respond to all other patients who require medical care. Because as that number of people admitted uh, or number of people who might be dying with this disease increases, you know, we're, we're 
both of those numbers talk about people's ability to access care, people's ability to get into care earlier, how big this outbreak is getting. Um, and so when you look at, there was a study from University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation from end of last week, which some think is very, actually probably underestimates the impact of this in the United States. That study said that up on the, up on the upper side of this is 70,000 to 170,000 you know, people die of this infection. And they said of, of the healthcare capacity, 41 states will fall short um, of their capacity to provide the hospital beds. Um, so there are a total of, I believe it was um, 40 something thousand beds that are needed and 16,000 um, ICU beds that are needed that will fall the short at the peak of this at, in the United States, yeah. right? The, the other number that we sort of look at, you know, that I sort of pay attention to is the doubling rate. How quickly are our cases increasing in each of these different metro, metropolitan areas, but also elsewhere? Um, because the speed, the acceleration, it, right now is both a, you know, it's a reflection of the fact that we're getting better at testing more people, so that might be part of why. But at some point when testing sort of catches up, it's going to reflect the true acceleration and give us some point of view to where the peak might be in particular geographical areas. I mean, there's no one peak. The other different areas will have different peaks, but those are sort of the two numbers that I'm paying attention to closely right now. Yeah. And, and, and Jenny, if I can jump to you from here, one of the numbers I think of as a global policy person is this beds number, right? And, and there are countries where major hospitals, the number of ventilators is a single digit. And, 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 and that's a very different order of public health and health policy challenge. But what I wanted to come back to you was what you had said earlier, the politics of it, that this odd situation we are in that I have never seen anything, anything, not climate, not anything, where the global concern is as pervasive and everyone is 100% sort of focused on this. And yet I don't see a global response either as in countries or leaders coming and saying, okay, here is what we will all do together. You know, Italy gets into a problem and France says, we can't send you stuff because we might need it ourselves. Yeah, Adil, um, that's a, um, it's, it's an issue that it becomes extremely um, apparent at the moment, as we in the United States are also struggling with access to, um, uh, PPE, the protective equipment, the masks, the gowns that our, our um, healthcare workers need to protect themselves. Um, you start to lose healthcare workers just by illness, not, not, a, not at death, but, but that's occurring as well. Um, and suddenly um, the burden on a smaller number of, of healthcare workers becomes even greater. We have not, we have not thought about that. Um, and if you step back from what's happening at the moment, um, the shortcomings that we have at the moment are because of a lack of investment in advance, in a preparedness for this kind of a situation. Um, th there have been some, a couple of bright lights that have, that have made it easier to move more rapidly. I'll just give you one, um, and that is that after SARS and MERS, our colleagues at the National Institutes of Health and the Vaccine Research Center said, you know, these coronaviruses look like they're going to be dangerous and they're evolving and they're appearing. We need to have in advance a platform to make a vaccine for the next coronavirus. And they started to work on that. Um, I've had conversations with them um, in, in the last um, week or so because I'm working on a report for our National Academy of Medicine on the preparedness issue, not um, at the moment, but what we have or have not done in the past. And even NIH with all of its resources, they said they couldn't work simultaneously on platforms for multiple path potential pathogens because they just didn't have the resources. So they picked coronavirus. And they came up with this messenger RNA delivery system. And then when this happened, very quickly, when the sequence was made available, they went from the sequence to the specific protein on this virus 
that was likely to be useful in a vaccine. They put it into this platform and two companies are now working on making this. Um, a, a phase one clinical trial started uh, maybe a week and a half or so ago. Um, this is unprecedented. Will we have a vaccine to use in this outbreak? Well, vaccines are given to healthy people to prevent disease. And certainly in this litigious country, we take no risk, um, and especially giving something to a healthy person. So there's extensive safety. Um, and then you have the problem, if this is a global issue, how do you make a vaccine to deliver basically to everybody in the world? Um, do you take a position that I've seen in the press? I don't know how true it is or not, but somebody in this country, in addition to trying to buy another country, has attempted to buy one of the companies working on this messenger RNA vaccine and take its entire product for use in the United States. It came to the point that you were um, pointing out uh, earlier. We have no system around the globe to manufacture at scale. Once you have a product that is both effective and safe, um, and we have no way of prioritizing where it should be used to have the greatest global impact in controlling an epidemic like this. We should have been doing this in the last five to 10 years. If we do it in the next five to 10 years it, in the way it needs to be done, I'd be shocked. But that's absolutely what we have to do. For countries where it is now beginning to be seen, what is the best advice you have to their leaders? Knowing that they are resource constraints, knowing that they are capacity constraints, what are the most important things that can, should be done immediately for where the curve is just beginning to be seen? Well, this is a, a, a resource dependent issue, but I think that, that you know, if you're really at the very beginning of an epidemic, um, there are measures, both you know, some of the social distancing measures, but testing, um, identification and isolation of infected patients, quarantine of exposed patients, and contact tracing. These require a fair amount of human resources in particular, uh, but, but some of these measures have been very effective in, in Singapore, for example, um, and actually I think they were applied in China towards the end of the E outbreak. If you can do this early and really separate out the people that are infected um, or those that are been exposed that might be infected, um, you can help you know, sort of pr break the chain of transmission early. But again, that, that requires resources. You know, there's been discussion of doing this in the United States, you know, the cat's out of the bag now. I think towards the end, when this starts to tail off, then we can start doing contact tracing as part of our uh, public health interventions. But, but, but for a country, you know, where it's just starting to take off, that's one potential strategy. Now, he seemed to you, you know, I had never thought I would live to see the day when countries would be more concerned about how many face masks they have than how much oil they have. And there we are. You work in a lot of like, like, like all both of our other guests in, in countries that have those resource constraints that don't have very extensive systems. What would be your advice uh, to, to developing countries particularly? One thing that I was going to mention is that at least the countries that you know I work in with West Africa and and, and um, Central and East Africa, like with the Ebola recent Ebola experiences, there is institutional memory. There is some public health memory on doing this. I mean, all of West Africa closed down. The three countries that were involved in the West African uh, epidemic closed down, schools closed down, hospitals had to maintain this distance. You know, on the ground, a lot of the measures that you're seeing outside, you were seeing this in West Africa and in, in, the, in the middle of an Ebola epidemic. And so the social distancing is not something that dis that's distant, at least in some of the countries that I've worked in and, and something that um, is being adopted. The other thing that has been um, adopted are, are some of the, the emergency coordination operations or structures that were created as recently as last summer for the DRC epidemic, you know, our outbreak for Ebola are now being translated in the same countries to be applied um, to organize the information, you know, distribute the information, make policy decisions. And so there, there is 
some legwork already done. You know, I, I think the main things are social distancing. I will say one other thing, and, and this is my opinion only, seeing the cases that are popping up in, in countries like Sierra Leone and, and Burundi and Uganda right now, I know we're tempted to say these are the first cases identified there. I've provided care in those settings. Most of the times there are people who may come in with a disease that looks like it might be a certain disease with, but without the capacity to diagnose it, you will never know that's what it is. And so I would not be surprised if in many of those countries there already is community transmission. And so social distancing, um, things that we did during Ebola, which is you know, ensuring hand hygiene and, and, and temperature, as, as David said, is not good for this one, but limiting crowds and, and stopping you know, assemblies um, is, is a critical step to ensuring, particularly in areas where there's high population density, that this does not spread higher. Jerry, uh, same, same question, Jerry, but I want to flip it. What's your advice to your friends at WHO? <laughs> uh, WHO, I think, um, certainly has done a lot better now than they did at the outset of the West Africa Ebola outbreak. They have to give clear guidance and, and information. Um, I think they've been they've been trying. Um, uh, they are an important source of of in, information and guidance for many of the low and middle income countries, um, the kind of places that you were talking about that Nahid and and David referenced. Um, I I can't just just stop and think about what these countries can and need to do now. I'm thinking about what needed to be done in advance. So think of your question about what advice you give to try to mitigate against the, the further transmission. Um, so the one clear message that's come across is trying this social distancing of people who are symptomatic and, and probably exposed. But think about it, one of the major recommendations with transmission of this kind of a virus is hands and hand washing. What do you do in a country where there's no water, where there's no soap? Hand sanitizer? Are you kidding? Um, that's an issue that is near and dear to your heart in, in terms of development. Why haven't we invested better in dealing with these basic human and social needs around the world. Why are there so many bad leaders around the world who think not about their, their population and their responsibility, but of their own um, life and lifestyle and bank account? <laughs> you know, I, I, that's maybe, maybe too pie in the sky. It doesn't relate to where we are now, but it's certainly part of it. And then another area of of near and dear to your own heart, um, which is um, climate and environment. Well, we know that particulate pollution and the lungs don't work well together. Um, that's an exacerbating factor um, for sure in any respiratory disease like this. So um, to think about um, uh, removing emissions controls from automobiles in the United States. And you saw the numbers about that. Our, these policies have to go all across the, the domains. It's not just uh, this virus and patients who are infected. This is a, a global and a systemic issue that we need to think about. Mm -hmm. So David, to make a plug here, you know, last Friday, we at the party center started a video series called uh, The World After Coronavirus. Mm. And we've been releasing every day a video with major experts on what the world after this virus will look like. Mm. This isn't the first epidemic, it wouldn't be the last. And, uh, and one of the things that's come up again and again is this realization that we seem to be much better prepared to uh, fight each other than we are to fight disease. <laughs> Uh, what are the lessons that you would want the world to learn from this one that, that we haven't learned from the previous one? And particularly, if, if I can try to put a good spin on it, what are, we, what are some of the things you are seeing around the world that are good, that are right? 
Well, I think it's a challenging question to me. I, I, you know, I think that there, we're going to be seeing more epidemics in the future, and there, many of them are going to be respiratory disease, but some may be vector-borne disease, and they require different approaches in terms of uh, surveillance. But I think strengthened surveillance, the ability to rapidly scale up testing, the ability to s rapidly scale up you know, various kinds of public health interventions that are useful for preventing that kind of disease. And you know, as Jerry mentioned, hand hygiene is something that crosses over um, many, many areas. There's one area that I think that, that we haven't talked about today very much, which Nahid and, and I are both very concerned about, and that is protecting the, the health workforce. Um, in, in low-income countries, you know, there are very limited numbers of physicians and, and you know, maybe more nurses, but there's often a shortage of, of human resources for health. And, and if you knock it out early in an epidemic with illness um, or death, then you've got a major problem. And this is obviously a, was a major threat for Ebola, but I think it's, it's become a threat in, in the places hit by uh, coronavirus. Um, you know, I, I think, the, well, those are a few thoughts. I think Nahid probably has some, some additional thoughts on this question also. Yeah, thanks, David. And, you know, and it's um, on this call this morning with my colleagues from Uganda, you know, we were comparing um, all these, a lot of healthcare facilities in the United States because of the lack of personal protective equipment for having to pursue strategies about decontaminating and reusing personal protective equipment. Right. Um, there, there's data from last week that says that the virus can last on a mask for seven days after it's been used, surgical mask. And it's interesting because, you know, we're, we're, some of the recommendations are use, reuse the mask if you don't have PPE, you know. And so the, when, when you talk about the kind of dearth and scarcity that we're facing here, you, we talk, you know, how do we even pursue these strategies for protection in healthcare settings? Um, they don't have that luxury to potentially decontaminate and may not have personal protective equipment, uh, enough personal protective equipment to begin with, and generally don't. I mean, even when there is no outbreak in a lot of settings, you know, there's this conversation of, as, as, as Jerry said, how do we get enough water to wash our hands and we get hand sanitizer? Um, so, I mean, I, it, it is, but it is critical. And, and I think that, you know, some of this had to have started beforehand. And, 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 and the other thing that's sort of needed um, is, is actually having focused interventions on improving the training of healthcare workers in, in a lot of those areas. We've talked a lot about infection control training for healthcare workers, not just during outbreaks in resource limited settings, but beforehand, because that helps decrease transmission of all diseases. And had that been done beforehand, I think that helps with some of the, the, the mitigation that could have happened now in resource limited settings. And so now is, is, it's never too late. Everything you do is an intervention that saves a life, that saves, that saves a healthcare worker, that saves somebody from getting sick. But you know, this is how it could have been done more efficiently, as Jerry and others have said, is to do it beforehand. But one thing also that I kind of wanted to bring up, and I think both David and Jerry and you will have a lot to say about, is the role of good governance. So um, Adil was my, 15, 20 years ago, <laughs> was my uh, thesis advisor. And my thesis was on global health security and the role of governance, good governance and ensuring this. And, and it's, it, Jerry's sort of pointed to this about the good governance here in the United States and, and elsewhere. But like a lot of this stuff needs to happen beforehand. And then it, there needs to be some sort of, I think, discipline about good governance by governments during outbreaks. There has to be some sort of science about this that needs to come out of this that can sort of guide the policy. Yeah. And, and a lot of it, thank you for that comment, it's, a lot of it is about governance. And to any of you, maybe we'll start with Jerry, but you know, we prepare for wars that are not being fought, but may happen all the time. Right? It is standard policy to prepare for something that's not happening but could happen. And we do it at a grand scale. Why can't we or why haven't we be able to do that for disease, which frankly is both more dangerous and more likely than the type of wars that we prepare for? What, what will it take for, for that to happen? You know, um, I think it's already... Uh, everything that needed to happen to make that change has happened, and we still ignore it. So I have little faith um, that 
Um, that that's very likely to um, to happen. Um, look at the expansion of the budget for the Department of Defense in this country in this administration. Do they need it? Well, they may say yes, but um, would you do that to the scale that they that the the budgets did, and starve the health and the public health? You know, I, I think when you have troops marching, when you have fighter planes flying, um, people take note of that. Um, when nothing happens in public health because you've done something, people forget it. It's a lesson that we learn again and again, and we never act on it. The, the memory does not persist. I think we need some global psychiatry um, to kind of of change the attitudes and set the priorities. I don't see it happening. I don't see the leadership. I don't see the insight. Um, I hate to say it, um, we're doomed. D David, 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 uh, save me from Jerry of little faith. Uh, <laughs> give me some, some bright light because I, I do see, not just in the US, but across the world, people galvanizing and understanding what you were saying about health workers. So I, 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 in, in South Asia, doctors and nurses come out of a, of, a, of a hospital and you have people saluting them standing in line. So will that moment last? And more importantly, do you, do you have any more faith than, than Jerry that maybe we can turn this curve? I'm a little more of an optimistic than Jerry, um, I think, but but I think it's not going to necessarily come from the governments of countries. It's going to come from the people themselves, and that that and this gets back to your earlier question, which is you know what is the medium term impact of this? You know I think we're going to learn. I think there's going to be an increased awareness of respiratory hygiene, of hand hygiene, um, the the importance of social distancing in the context of an outbreak. And, and these lessons are at least going to stick with the, the current generation. Um, and, and, and I think that you know, they're, they're, there's a lot learned that, and, and if we have more outbreaks in the future, the, these you know, sort of what, what we've learned and what we've applied in this setting um, can be reapplied very quickly. Um, I think that's big. I, I, I think that there's a much greater appreciation of healthcare workers and, and, and their role and, and the importance of keeping them healthy. Um, and that's, that's been true across the world. That could easily be forgotten if there's not, you know, sort of if, if things go back to where they were. What, what I'm worried about is, is that we're going to, this may not just end, but it may come back and ebb and flow. And that we're going to have to sort of learn how to respond, um, loosen our guard, respond again. And, and that this, these, some of these behaviors may become more ingrained over time. And, and that, that will be protective. And this is not looking at things from the, the highest level, but really looking at the community level. Can I back off from my pe pessimism um, <laughs> just, just very briefly? Um, well, I am older than David, so I've seen more and, I, and I, uh, I can justify some of my pessimism. But the point is that we don't stop trying. Um, and, and that I think is characteristic of the health and public health um, community. And the second thing is that we have learned, um, and we see it in this outbreak, that this is one globe. This is one global population. What happens anywhere can happen anywhere else. We're in this together. And if we can't make that message come out clear and strong in every country, including our own, um, then I'll return to my pessimism. But I think we have a chance to do that. And people need to realize that um, we, we cannot isolate. We cannot put up a wall at the border and expect it to protect us. We need to be engaged. We need to share our resources. Um, we need to have a bit of love. Then maybe something will happen. If I can take exactly that, uh, it seems to me that you know there are multiple issues where uh, if something bad happens in one place, everyone else is also affected. One of the, you know, maybe not unique, but important aspects of this is that if something good happens in some place, meaning if someone can control it, everyone else is better off. And, and that positive is, is, is something different. For example, that's not always true for climate. Uh, 
but but I, I wanted to see, you know, you and I keep talk, meeting. I wish we could meet for other reasons than uh, than <laughs> epidemics. And, and we keep meeting for words that I didn't even know before that meeting. My, my vocabulary increases, Ebola, Zika, uh, COVID-19. What will it take for us <laughs> to be able to talk about these things as things to be prevented and victories? Uh, what do you see having gone through all of these episodes, even in a much younger life than Jerry's? Uh, I could never compete with Jerry's or David <laughs> or your experience, so let me start there. Uh, but um, there was a wonderful op-ed by Peter Dejak, who's who, from Eco Health Alliance, who both David and, and Jerry know. Um, and, and he wrote that we now live in an age of pandemic, pandemics, right? We um, First and foremost, I think it is an act of acceptance, the fact that we live in an age of pandemics. You know, this idea that, that it's very hard to sell to the public, to the policymakers, to others who are outside this field, this idea of a stitch in time saves nine. You know, this very simple thing of a disaster prevented is a disaster that is, is doesn't, if it doesn't happen, then it didn't happen, and why are we funding this, right? The, the prevention is always sort of a hard thing to sell. But I, I think that acceptance... Um, at all levels, you know, I, I, from from the from the healthcare side, the idea that this is something that we integrate this resilience or possibility that this will happen again, not oh this could happen again, this will happen again. So how do we build in that resilience at every level of public health preparedness, every level of healthcare healthcare preparedness? But you know, the others have spoken about this anecdotally, but look at what SARS did to the culture of many uh, Asian countries that are now also impacted by COVID-19. There was this subtle, when I was speaking to, um, a few years ago, I was in Taiwan doing this uh, training with CDC, Taiwanese CDC for Asia Pacific countries. And when you spoke to them, you know, I was t talking to them about Ebola, when you spoke to them, they talk about their experience and this personal memory at, at, the, at the public level of what this means, you know. Um, and so what I think, what I hope happens after this epidemic, because it's so big enough, has touched every part of the world, and we are so globally connected, more so than we ever were, to see each other's experiences online, is that this, this helps us internalize that this, this will happen again. And for us to understand that when this happens again, how quickly we need to act and, and what those actions of personal responsibility need to be at every level, not just government and healthcare and public, but for every person to undertake. And, and that goes to David's point earlier that the public reaction and the public memory of what they've gone through will have a major part. You know, there is a generation of college students who will always remember this spring as the spring of Zoom, <laughs> right? The Zoom has become a verb. <laughs> Uh, thanks to 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 COVID, uh, I, I, David. I have a quick question for you, and then I have a last question for everyone. I wanted to do uh, Robin uh, round Robin, but first, David, for you, what will for for our viewers? What will we need to see? What will you need to see that will give you a sense that okay, we are now beginning to beat it, right? So when we are talking about numbers and stuff, what are the type of indicators that in any country you would take seriously? which would give you the sense that, okay, now the curve is being bent or flattened. I mean, COVID-19 became a notifiable disease very early in the outbreak, um, you know, to the, the World Health Organization. And most countries made it, uh, you know, if not all countries made it notifiable. And so I think there's careful tracking at the state level, even down to the county level in the United States, at the you know, federal level in many countries. And so we, we have data, um, you know, how good the reporting is may vary by place. And one, one of the points I wanted to make earlier that I didn't get to is, that I think there's been more transparency, at least it seems like there's been more transparency on the part of the Chinese government, for example, um, maybe not the Iranian government, but at least the Chinese government in, in this outbreak. And I think that's been very helpful. Um, also, a lot of collaborations across countries that are, you know, scientific collaborations that are very helpful. But, but I think we, you know, we have real data and we can use those data both um, the you know, reported confirmed cases, but also hospitalizations, ICU admissions, as Nahid said earlier, you know, those, are, those are solid data that are indicators of, of the, the, the sort of epidemiologic curve. Um, what, what's gonna be hard is if we do this sort of proverbial flatten the curve, you know, if this is broadened out over a longer period of time, there's gonna be a long tail till this ends. And, and that's, that's the time where we've gotta be careful 
we may have to keep some degree of social distancing and other public health measures in place. Um, but we're going to have to have more enhanced awareness and, and, and communication to try and avoid having a resurgence. Um, but it's, you know, I, think, I think we have real data that we can use to, to, to answer that question. And one of the things I'm picking up from all three of you is sort of this, this, this thing that you are alerting us to that even when it goes away, it doesn't go away. Uh, there can be a resurgence of COVID-19 itself, but also of other things that, that this, this thing that, okay, we'll beat it and then we'll be back to a previous normal is just, ain't, that ain't going to happen. Uh, I will give each of you one wish and you can choose who you are saying this to, but if you could change, whether it's the president of a country or people, what is the one thing you would want done and by whom? right now, right here, that you think will make this better either for COVID-19 or for, for future things. So choose who you give that advice to and, 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 and tell me what would you tell someone to do by dropping everything else right now? Uh, I, I'll tell you what I told my students. Yeah. I, I sent an, a letter to my alumni and I said, my ask to you is not give me a check, go wash your hands. <laughs> Just do that for me, and I'll come come for your philanthropy later. And you accept the check and wash your hands. <laughs> I, I'll do that. Too. Look, but I'm I'm a I'm a very yes. I'm a very senior citizen. So, at once it puts me at greater risk of of this virus, but it also gives me the largesse to say whatever I want to say. <laughs> so let me let me try to put it in a different context. Um, and, uh, and, and Nahid um, referred to uh, Peter Dayshack. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, Peter Dayshack and his colleagues organized a, a letter um, that is circulated around the globe, has been signed on by the scientific community, tens of thousands now, um, saying that, you know, the, talking about this and scapegoating as the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus. And, and suddenly um, the issue is politicized and, and scapegoated in that manner with repercussions um, in every society is not the way to go. The conspiracy theories that we have seen jump out of the woodwork. This letter said, we are in solidarity with the Chinese scientists, the healthcare workers, who have put in the time, have exposed themselves, have suffered, um, and we need, we need to have this global solidarity. So it's not at, the, at an individual level, but I think it's equally as important. We need to continue to push that message. Yeah, there will be global. A one David, world. David, who can do what that you would want done? That's a difficult question because some of the people I'd like to say a few things to um, probably aren't as effective in making things happen. But I mean, I guess I would say, you know, that it would be really nice to have, you know, the leadership of the World Health Organization playing a more active role. The problem is they don't have, you know, they can say things and communicate, but they don't really have the power to make change. You need global leadership in a time like this because this is not just a disease hurting the United States or, or Italy or the UK. This is, this is gonna really hurt a lot of countries that I've worked in and, and many of my friends over, over the last 30 years. And I'm really quite worried about that. Nahid, who can do what that you would want to do? Well, I was gonna say something akin to what Jerry said, which is you know, to, for individuals to real, realize sort of the individual responsibility aspect of this, because it really the biggest change comes from there because it affects us all our actions affect everybody else. But since he's already said it, I'm actually gonna take this moment to instead, um, I would reach out to my fellow healthcare workers of, of every type who are in the middle of a war right now. And it's going to be a long, 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 not just a sprint, but a marathon. And, and for us to sort of be in this, you know, combined in, in this way, um, uh, to, to, to fight this across the different countries, to, to across different facilities. Um, I, I just want to send them a message of solidarity. It's, I've been in this before. I mean, I, um, I've, with Ebola, I, I lost friends. You know, I, I had 
people who I knew who got infected um, to this disease. And even though this disease doesn't necessarily cause, um, thankfully, you know, as, 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 as higher mortality, um, we're already being touched by people who have gotten sick. You know, every day I'm having to call a coworker or someone I know in another hospital and say, hey, did your test come back? Hey, how are you feeling? And it's, it's a scary moment for all of us, but it's also a moment that's uniting us. And so I think a message of solidarity. Let me, let me as I thank you, thank not just you, but uh, through you, thank all, all of your colleagues, everyone uh, who is a frontline uh, worker in this, and certainly everyone in the medical uh, profession, but, but also so many others. I think one of the realization is how many frontline people we have. Uh, just like we as societies have come to respect, as we should, those who are willing to give up their life for us in terms of national security, I think it is time that we also recognize and honor in the same way those who are on the front line um, putting their lives at risk uh, for human security. Uh, yes. I also, so I want to thank you for that. And I want to salute all your, all your colleagues uh, on behalf of all of us for that. But I will end with the following thought. There is an odd sort of optimism in this conversation, even with Jerry. <laughs> there is an odd optimism, and I think it's a good optimism because all of you, despite everything you've said, have A, highlighted that we need to come together, but B, are not giving up on the idea that we can't come together. Right? This is what, what Jerry said, that that, that I think is, is something remarkable. I have never in my life seen an issue that has galvanized as much information, sometimes not always the best quality, but as much information, as much political clout, as much even uh, concern, uh, as much talk. I just wish and I hope and I wish you well that we can take this moment and not turn it into simply a moment that happened and became a memory, but a moment that brings real change. So thank you, all three of you, for all you do. And thank you, everyone out there uh, who's doing anything. Now, everyone who's watching, please go and wash your hands. <laughs> thank you.